The Surfing Violinist presents The Surf Log, Episode 21. The surf giveth and take it away. On Thursday, September 22nd, 2022, Tate and I took a road trip to the East Coast to see if we could catch a bit of swell generated by Hurricane Fiona. For the ride, Tate bought me a copy of Barbarian Days, A Surfing Life by William Finnegan to be our on-road entertainment. Hearing Finnegan's experiences learning to surf on Oahu's lesser known nooks and crannies was a great way to get pumped for some surf exploration. We made our first destination Flagler Pier. I've been keeping up a bit with Flagler Pier because it just so happens to be one of Robbie McCormick's local haunts. I've been awed by Rasta Rob surfing ever since we witnessed his aerial antics as covered back in the surf vlog episode 5, which covered the time he came to our home break and proved to me that I can no longer blame my poor performance on lack of wave size or perfection. He was surfing circles around me as I was just trying to avoid face planning in the dumpy, newly dread shore break conditions. Rasta Rob, of course, not long after, catapulted himself into international fame by taking a wildcard spot in Stab High, Costa Rica all the way to the finals with some of the most insane aerial completion rates the contest has ever seen. When we pulled up to the Flagler Pier for the surf check, we thought we saw him tearing the lips off of a rippable right north of the pier, and we braced ourselves to sit on the shoulder and just watch. It turned out Rasta Rob was an Indo at that very moment, competing in the most recent stab high at Lakey Peak, and the guy we were mistaking for Rob was a dude named Ryan. Let's just say the caliber of surfing per capita at Flagler Pier is markedly higher than any given day at one of our local haunts. Me and Tate set up a bit further north looking for swing wide sets, and I just kept eating takeoffs and closeouts. It was embarrassing. None Nonetheless, Tony Caruso still got some shots of me and Tate even in that crowd. Tate even made the Instagram short list with a backside schwack. We surfed till after dark and gained a bit more confidence as the crowd thinned. And while we both caught a few fun ones to get our legs loose for the rest of the trip, the highlight was a moment that was so strange it will definitely go in my top 10 favorite not a wave moments. The mullet were running back and forth just outside the impact zone and on one wave they joined Dan the bodyboarder for a bit of surf. I'm so glad that Tony was there to document this because I witnessed this from out back and it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in the lineup. Dan goes right, the school of mullet leading him along, and he decides to hit an air section. I suppose one of these mullet gets spooked because right when Dan launches from the lip, this mullet launches. And from my angle, it looks like Dan launches the mullet from the bottom of his board, almost like he's playing mullet softball. The mullet proceeds to perform the highest amplitude air of the day. In mullet feet, this is approximately 40 feet, and that's just off the lip. I can tell you from the backside, it was another 30 easy, so 70 foot mullet kick out. Aerialists, maybe you should just pray to reincarnate as mullets. Anyways, I got a kick out of the mullet air, but was even more stoked to discover that Tony Caruso had documented the whole thing. So check out Picks by Tony, link in the description. I bought this one for myself. You just never know what's going to happen during a surf session, so treasure every moment. And let's compensate our photogs fairly, because the only thing that comes close to living those sessions is getting back home and finding out that those sessions weren't just hallucinations and big flyaway fish stories. It's an omen. I opened my car door. We just got a great little deal in this hotel. Open my car door. This thing comes flying out at me. It exploded. A Molotov gallon of water. It does not appear to be huge. Uh, uh, no, it doesn't. We found a hotel in Daytona and started Friday morning out at New Smyrna. The wind was offshore, the waves were fun, and the crowds were manageable. Tate definitely got the best of the session, but for my first session at Smyrna, I was happy with the result. Tate found us a hotel room at the Sandcastle right next to Sun Glow Pier in Daytona. We watched a couple groms attempt an ill-fated paddle out in the turbulent conditions, and were impressed when one of the kids on a long soft top actually found a ride. After the wind got even worse, we went back to Smyrna for a few Victory at Sea paddle outs. We came to surf, so if all we got were white watery doomed duck dives, it was at least something. I had much more fun on Saturday morning, even in the less than stellar conditions. For the most part, I kept up with Tate's paddle out through Mayhem Pace, and we found a few, I won't say diamonds in the rough, but surfable wave-like mounds in the tumult. All in all, we were very thankful to be able to surf Smyrna, even during less than ideal conditions with hardly anyone to no one else out. Gulf Coast boys will take tattered leftovers after a summer like the one we've suffered this year, so feels good overall. We decided to end our East Coast trip with a ride up A1A just to see if any spots were handling the constant onshore barrage any better. It was good for me to get a lay of the land of East Coast spots, 
and begin to connect the dots that for decades have just existed in a kind of blob of vague East Coast surf in my mind. We stopped once more at Flagler Pier, right as just about everyone else was leaving the water on the north side due to the wind. We were eventually joined by a few other surfers, the Groms paddled out at the main peak, and I was way outside when Tate caught a nice one that he worked all the way in. As the surf would have it, Tate and I were witnesses to some of the last moments of Flagler Pier and Sunglow Pier. The following week, the surge from Hurricane Ian decimated the ends of both of them. Florida is a house built on the sand, and so we can't be too surprised when these kinds of things happen, but it's always a bit shocking to witness the business end of the sport we love so much. I only have two sessions worth of memories from Flagler Pier, but I'm thankful for both of them, and hoping the Flagler crew will have an even more glorious pier and accompanying surf spot in the future. After Flagler, we continued on along our A1A surf spot bingo binge, and decided to spend the last of the Fiona leftovers on Mayport Poles. When we walked up, the wind was good and the waves were clean, first clean waves we'd seen all day, and by the time we hit the water, the wind was back on it. But still, we had a good time. I've taken a very circuitous route in my life, so it's only fitting that the best surf trip I've ever taken, mainly because I'm more skilled at the sport than I ever was before, happened on an impromptu East Coast trip with less than stellar surf overall. My skate pilgrimage in February and this Hurricane Fiona pilgrimage in September have proved to be two of the most recalibrating journeys of my life, solidifying for me that surfing and skating are part of my essence, and I should not have spent so much time away from either. Thanks to all the surfers, skaters, skimmers, photogs, sales reps, big companies, competitors, surf shop owners, and employees for keeping these subcultures alive. The session, whatever its location, whatever its ideal condition, whatever type of board it revolves around, the session is home for people like us, and it feels good to be home. The next week, we in Panama City Beach had the promise of a potential swell or certain doom from Hurricane Ian, depending on the storm's pathing. So me and one of my other surf buddies, Andy, decided to do some spot reconnaissance if the storm wasn't heading right for us. When it became clear the storm was going south and east, we decided we would try to meet the swell head on and take a gamble at St. George Island and Cape Sandblast. It turns out our calculations were way off and we never found much more than a rideable wave. We spent the better part of the day driving, only to return to our home break without even getting wet, just in time to witness the swell reach our shores. And the few waves we witnessed from the boardwalk were in fact the swell in its entirety. The window for our stretch of beaches was less than two hours, and me and Andy never even got in the water. So you win some, you lose some, but this is the price you pay to feel at home during a session. My local legend feature interviews have been delayed. I'm a few months behind here. I finally, uh, at the time of this release of this video, this is like the September vlog and I still haven't released it yet. I was trying to hold out to be able to talk to Rob Stalvey. Finally did get to talk to him here at the end of November. So uh, you can expect that interview uh, sometime. I'm probably gonna cut all four interviews, Justin, Karen, Rhett, uh, Rob, and now Ryan Avi will be next. Uh, Rob talked through some of the paintings he's made from places he's visited around the world and including some local surf spots as well, so look forward to that interview with Rob. We did have one run of swell in September that Michael Cassani got some sweet photos of at the park. My surfing form is improving, but my facial expressions remain Neanderthal drama nerd. So a lot of work still to be done on the composure front, thanks to Michael Cassani for these great shots. Until next time, keep it consistent, even if the conditions won't cooperate. Godspeed, lords and ladies. To see these videos early, without ads, join the lineup here on YouTube. You just need a YouTube account, and for $1.99 a month, you click this little join button and sign up to get early and ad-free access to four monthly vlogs. The Surf Vlog, the Masala Vlog, the Violin Vlog, and the Family Vlog. Thank you very much.